Um, well, welcome. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm going to just, I have on the screen here what I'm planning to share with you guys, um, but feel free to interrupt me if you have questions too, um, to talk about positive environmental science and why, why we have it, why I made it. Um, and then I have a bunch of different kinds of problems that I have on the site that I wanted to demonstrate for you guys, um, share how I've used and things that have been helpful for my students and then kind of share some future plans with you. Um, but again, yeah, if, if I, oh, here we go, I skipped ahead. Yeah. Okay, so um, I just wanna tell you guys first a little bit about me. I've been teaching physics and honors physics since 2014 and I adopted positive physics as like my whole curriculum when textbook replacement um, during the pandemic when we all switched to online and I just love it so much. Um, I found that it's like less copying, um, less grading for me. I have a really predictable routine for my students where I like, do some demonstration problems and then they work and then we you know get to see where their where their concerns are um and then move on to more fun stuff so we have i feel like i have more time to plan fun things like labs um and uh activities because i'm not spending as much time grading and planning in that class uh, so it's been really great and so i thought it would also be great to have it for my environmental science class i've also been teaching ap environmental science since 2012 um, and I've been a reader for the AP exam since 2020, um, only online so far. Uh, but I have a good idea of like what what's on the test at this point and what kids need to know. And um, I started last fall by making math questions because the math was the part that my students always really struggled with. Um, so I started writing like for each unit math based questions so that we could practice more. Um, I knew that it was always a big struggle for my students, but I also had students who were, you know, doing great in physics or AP calculus and thinking, you know, it's not the math in apes is not that hard or environmental science in general. Um, but they just need more practice. If they just see one example in a little corner of the textbook, they're not getting enough practice to feel prepared for the test. Um, so I rolled it out with my own class last last fall throughout the year and wrote questions for all the different topics. And I just was gonna share with you guys my scores, hang on, for, oh, sorry. Let me just exit the full screen for a second. No, why am I? Presentation isn't going to the next part. Okay, so thanks for your patience. Um, so this is um I think really cool that I oh it's loading for a second. Yeah, this is my um scores for the free response question. This is my score report from 2021, which is since the only time I taught it since the redesign, um, besides this year as well. And um, if you look at question three, which is the analyze an environmental problem and propose a solution. In that year, it was their biggest struggle. The math-based FRQ was the most difficult question for them. Overall, my students still did really well, but the math part was a big struggle for them. Um, and then this last year, my students, the math question, the math-based FRQ was their like moment to shine. That was the best, their best scores. So um, overall, I think my students did pretty well both of the years and I had different students and a lot of factors with um, the 2021 year since we started online. I think it was a little different for everybody, but um, I just found it to be a big success. So right now, this year, I'm not just only doing the math questions because those are important, but I'm also making questions for all of the different topics and science skills on the AP exam. I'm not sure why my like clicking is not going to the next screen on its own. Sorry. So hold on. <laughs> so I just wanted to show you guys the... Um, there we go. Okay. The science practices. So if you have taught AP environmental science, you're probably familiar with this, but besides just all of the content that kids are expected to know about for all these different, all these different units, they're also expected to be able to apply that knowledge in different science practices. So being able to explain concepts, understand visuals, 
um, all of these things. So not just the math, the math is practice six, but there's also the data analysis and all of these different parts to it. So I've been trying to make questions that reflect that. Um, if you don't teach AP environmental science, or if you teach um, regular environmental science, the science and engineering practices in NG and NGSS are really, really similar, um, where you're not, not just having to know stuff, you're having to be able to do science and apply science. So um, what, I, what I'm hoping to show you guys today is that students will get lots of practice being able to do those things, and then also free up time to be able to do more labs or like take your kids outside um, with a transect to do, um, to get some data when you're studying biodiversity, for instance. And because you've had the opportunity to do a lot of these other practices that are going to be on the test um, on positive environmental science, then maybe you're not going to be spending as much of your prep time getting them ready with those things. And you can do some more fun stuff too. So I wanted to show you guys what it looks like to um, navigate the site. Um, there's a bunch of courses, as you can see now, when you log in. Oh, should I show them how to log in too? Or sure. Uh, I, I, I can show them that at the end. If, if Okay. All right. Jack will show you some more stuff at the end if I forget to show you some things. Um, but if you're, if you go into the course, you find environmental science, and then I have all of the nine units that are in the course exam description sure. for environmental science. Sorry, my phone is being loud over here. Um, and I've been working my way through as I teach it. And it's like uh, at this point about a month ahead of my students and hope to get a little more caught up over Christmas break um, with content. But we're I'll show you guys some uh, skills that they've done already. So in unit one, I want to show you a math-based skill. So here's the percent change with biogeochemical cycles is the first time they have percent change, which is like a really a uh, favorite question of the college board to put on um, on FRQs and on multiple choice questions. And so let me find the one I was gonna use you for you guys. So um, they'll have a question. There's like eight different practice questions for them to practice percent change here. Um, and these little boxes let them put in the numbers and the units. So they'll read this question. A farmer wanted to measure soil nitrogen before and after the growing season. Before planting, she measured the nitrogen at 39 milligrams nitrogen per kilogram soil. And after the harvest, she measured 17 milligrams of nitrogen per kilogram soil. What was the percent change in soil nitrogen? So a really classic question. Um, they have to figure out first what one to put in each box. And the formula they need to know for this is the new minus old over old. Um, or I always like to say, no, it's like N-O-O. -O. Um, <laughs> so the new one was after the harvest. So that's going to go first. And then you can click enter to check and see if you got it right as you go. So it's like um, very reassuring to students. so They can see um, if they're on the right track and then pick the best units. If they pick something that's not right, they um, get a little are supposed to get a little X um, that is not correct. And then they'll, uh, so, so for instance, if I picked this and that's not the answer, they get a little X in the corner of their box, but then that means they just get to try again. We're like, oh, okay, right. The answer should be percent. And then it just turns a light green. So they didn't get it on the first try, but they eventually got it. Um, and then they would calculate that and answer the things. I was just I don't know if I should keep doing all of the problems all the way, but I um, would encourage them to do it on Desmos because, I mean, you can do it actually on a calculator or also, but I just started also telling them they can practice on Desmos because um, on the PSAT and SAT digital versions now, it has Desmos built in as the calculator that they're allowed to use for the whole math section. So um, if I put that in, you know what? I'm also gonna show you guys what would happen if I put a wrong answer. So if I put that this was a 3% change, it would also tell me it's wrong. Oh, I already showed you that. But it, it would um, give me that answer. I'll just go ahead and do this one. Oops, I'm going to put too many things here. Real quick while Chelsea's typing that in, uh, when Chelsea goes back to the problem, if you, um, I just wanted to note that all those, pr all those numbers that are in blue are randomized values. So every student is getting different numbers so they can share strategies with each other, but they can't share answers. Thank you so much, Jack, for reminding me that. Yes, that I wanted to mention that. So every time you see a blue 
number that's randomized so that different, like all the students are getting a different number. So they won't be able to say like, what did you get for number two? But they can, like he was saying, share strategies. They can say like, oh, you have to make sure that you're putting the, the new value first or something like that. Um, so that's an example of a math question. Does anyone want to ask another ask a question before I move on to the next type of question? So I'll show you then if I go back to the dashboard, um, the next one I was going to do is um, a graph problem. So one I picked was from the beginning of unit three. So I broke unit three up into two different units because it's kind of a lot um, a lot of content. It's a, it's like a unit that you're expected to spend a little bit more time on. Um, for unit five, I broke it up into three sections because it's also a big unit. But uh, the survivorship curves was the graph I was going to show us. So in APES, there's a lot of different graphs that students are expected to be familiar with and read in a lot of different places. That was another area I saw students struggle with. Um, so these are also randomized graphs and randomized with like the animals that they're asking about too. Um, so this one about elephants, um, it's like which type of survivorship curve is shown. And so we look and see which one it would be and they can go compare it to their notes or click back on the lesson to look at the picture that's labeled and see which one it's supposed to be and then choose that. Okay, that one must be a type one curve. Oh, is it not? Oh, wait, I'm on the wrong one now. That's why. Okay, hang on. That one was type two. I went back to my question. I was on type one here for the elephant. Um, and then they have a follow-up question. So it's not just like randomly picking which one it is. So I have to like think about what's the reasoning why it's type one. And so they have a low chance of death early in life. And then a question that asks them to interact with the graph. So what percent of the elephants are surviving after 50 years? And so I'm gonna use my um, the graph and kind of hover on here. And it'll accept a range of values like within a percentage. So if you don't have to like put 50.27 that's on here, you can just estimate that it's 50. Um, if the kids eyeball it, it'll accept a range of correct answers. And then there's a follow-up calculation question too of if 47 elephants are born in one year, how many are still surviving in 40 years? And so they would have to interpret the graph from that too. So getting them to interact with the graph in a lot of different ways. Um, and then there's there's type type two survivorship curves and type three survivorship curves and the different animals there. So getting them to see lots of examples of data and get really comfortable with the graphs. Um, so that, that was that type that there was examples of graphs. And then I was going to show you guys or any questions on that one. OK. Um, uh, for a visual representation example, I was going to show you the biogeochemical cycles. I broke up the nitrogen cycle question into a couple parts. So, um, and also this is like one of those things that I know my students have really struggled with before, but um, with this year having having had lots of practice and being able to go back and do even extra practice, I can show you that in a little bit too, um, they felt a lot more confident. So this one's like a, like a labeling diagram. Um, and again, they like have the chance if they don't know it the first time, it'll tell them it's wrong, but then they can try again. Um, and so this one should be nitrogen fixation. And then there's some questions about it. Um, so we have different parts of the nitrogen cycle uh, and students can practice this in class together or, um, or as homework. And then this was like the second half of the nitrogen cycle. So um, it's really helped my students to break it up into these two parts of thinking about like, how does nitrogen get out of the atmosphere and into animals and plants? And then how does it go from from the biosphere, like back up into the atmosphere to break it into those two parts. Um, and so then there's little things they can click and choose the answers and learn from that. And so being able to be comfortable with those visual representations. 
Um, and there's some examples similar to this, like throughout the class, throughout the course. And then one other type of question I was going to show you guys is thinking about preparing for free response questions. So these ones I haven't assigned to my students. This is where I'm like just kind of uh, finishing up right now um, in unit five impacts of land and water use. So the green revolution was one that I made these questions to help them think about kind of like the words that they would be able to be used to seeing um, for a free response question that might ask them things like what's an economic benefit of mechanization um, or what's a human health benefit or what's a negative ecological consequence and just getting familiar with those terms and being able to apply those to lots of different things. So in this set of questions, they have all these different components of the green revolution and they'll read the little description here. So this one chemical compounds were used to control insect pests, weeds, and fungus. And so that must be pesticides. And then there's just different, um, different outcomes and they put them into categories here. And then this one, these questions, the, um, the four things that it can be, everyone has those same things, but they're all scrambled. Um, and then so that you wouldn't be like, oh, the the top one is economic prof uh, economic benefit. Like, well, it was for this person, but then like everyone has to think about it. So even if you're sharing answers, they'd have to at least be saying like what the whole thing is. You know what I mean? Um, then so those are like a whole bunch of the like, question example types, kind of all different things. Really trying to like give them experience and practice with all of the science skills. Um besides the math and then that way it can be kind of the whole like the whole routine of the class we um how I've been using it now is that I still assign reading and videos to watch but in class we'll start out by applying what they read about in the positive environmental science problems and then kind of troubleshoot in class if there's things that they're having a hard time with and I'll just show you also for the teacher side of how I would know what might need to be retaught is there's a student scores area. And I have it set to, so here's where we are right now is on, oh, we only started this one. So look at my block four. So my Ape students, I can see like who's been doing all of the problems so far. Um, who still needs to do them. That's the completion scores. So everyone that has 100%, they did all of it. But I can also click the accuracy scores and I can scroll through and be like, wow, okay, rates of plate motion, that's something that they were struggling with, maybe some of them more than others. Um, and I can look back at individual questions too. So I can look at, um, look at that specific skill and then find out was there like one question that was really tricky or um, one particular, uh, yeah, one particular type of question that was tricky for them or ask them like, you guys seem like you had a hard time with this. Do we wanna go over it again um, kind of thing. And so that's how I would check work. I would give full credit for the hundred percent, but then I'll like use the accuracy scores um, as a way to inform like what I need to readdress. Um, and if they wanted to, I won't do it to these kids, but I could reset their work too um, so that they could try again if they did get a really low accuracy score to give them a chance to improve next time. Um, so that's the, all the things I'd already planned to show you. Um, and then I wanted to share some future plans I have. I'm planning to make a semester review um, as its own unit so that you could assign it to students before the fall final or before the AP exam and they can go through and they'll, um, I'll put in questions uh, from all the different, all different skills that I would want them to go back and review. And it will give them like the same questions, but re-randomize it again too. So they'll like have to re recalculate things um, or relook at things. Um, I also have more content coming out. This is supposed to say for units five through nine for all of the rest of the year. So that will keep growing. It'll probably be like multiple parts for each of those units 
um, that we don't have right now. So if you go to the, the course um, right now, it's like five A, B and C. So there'll probably be like a six A and B, a seven A and B, eight A and B um, for those to all be kind of broken up into more parts um, for those bigger units. And also planning to uh, start next summer making video lessons for different topics. Um, we have that on the uh, physics side and chemistry side of the site, and it's such a great resource, but I just didn't want to overwhelm myself with that yet. Um, and also I'm planning to incorporate input from other teachers. Um, if you find things that you think uh, could be improved upon, I would love to know because it's definitely a work in progress. I'm working on it every day, <laughs> working on a little bit every day. Um, and I think it's a great resource for my own students, but I really want other students to get to learn from it too. And I want it to help other teachers um, be able to teach with it too. So, Jack, do you wanna take, uh, explain anything else? Or does anyone have a question, I guess, for me before I hand it over to Jack too? Chelsea, I actually had a question. So oh, I know, yeah. um, like with the physics, I would kind of teach for the first maybe third of class and then like turn them loose on their computers for the like the last part of class to like work on this. But I assume like the environmental science might be different. So I was just curious, like how do yeah. you structure your class and like yeah, how do you use this? That's a good question. So it definitely depends on the topic. And um, let me, yeah, let's look at like what I what we're working on right now. Let me go to the dashboard actually. So when I taught this on, um, what day was it? I think Tuesday we started this topic, um, learning about layers of the atmosphere, properties of air and albedo. So the first skill I had on here, albedo, is a cal calculation based question. So I always do a couple of those as demonstrations. I'll like do those up on the border like right on my iPad and project it. So I'll spend time um, explaining how to solve this problem um, and what it means. And then when we, but after I told them how to do that one, I assumed that they would know what to do for like the layers of the atmosphere part from their own reading and notes that they had with them. So I had them do this part um, without like specific teaching and then I'll just like check to make sure everyone got it. So for this skill, skill they were just like reading about, reading a little description of a part of the atmosphere and then matching it up with the, um, with the name of it. And so then they were able to do those ones um, without a problem on their own. So yeah, it definitely depends on the skill. And so some days there's not a calculation-based question and I'll just like have them do it, or if we don't get to everything in class, I'll have them finish it for homework before the test. But um, yeah, definitely for the calculation ones, I usually am still like doing some direct instruction. So that's then, a good question. And then Catherine asked in the chat, um, how long are your class periods and do you have your students every day or every other day? Or that's a good question. Yeah, I um, so I do three 45 minute classes and one 75 minute class a week. Um, we have like a modified block schedule. Um, so this will be like, um, part of, part of the class most days. Um, but I do also have them kind of front load the material by like reading the textbook. I'll assign a few pages to read and then also, um, assign a video to watch. I don't know if you guys also like, uh, know, like the Mr. Smeads videos that, um, my my kids really like it like and get a lot out of it so then they'll do do those things a combination of those things and they have to show a page of notes as like proof that they engage with that material in some way either the textbook or the videos or both um and so I'll like check their notes as they work on this and then this doesn't always take because I spread it out um it doesn't take the whole class. So we'll usually have time for other things too. On the long block uh, days, I try to make time for labs um, because that's a big part of the class as well. Um, and then some students get get through this part faster than others. So some of them are finishing it for, for homework the day before the test and some of them are getting it all done in class. 
and then uh, Bethany in the chat asked uh, which textbook uh, you're using. Um, I use the, this year I'm using the fourth edition of the Friedland book and um, because it aligns with the course exam description as well. And then I'm using this, I'm making this along the same alignment um, and order. So my students will read the textbook in order and then like able to do the positive environmental science in order as well. Gotcha. And then Emmanuel said in the chat, he is on a two day a week block schedule for 85 minutes, which seems really, really hard. But um, do you have any tips for him on those super long class periods? Oh, yeah, so I feel like this is a good tool to have if you have really long classes and you only see your kids a little bit because it breaks it up that you're not having to like be talking to them the whole time. You can like do short, like short uh, instruction or review and then give them time to work on this and then come back together. And I feel like that breaks up the class really well. So sometimes I'll still even do this on a long block day uh, when I am going to be with my students for 75 minutes. If we don't have a lab that we need to get done, then we'll still do like a little back and forth of positive environmental science and uh, and other stuff. I don't know. No. That sounds like that's something that would work for your kids. Um, I think it's really flexible too, that you could use it in different ways. Like some teachers have said they would use it as like a, as a bell ringer, like just pick one of the things to use as a bell ringer. Um, let's look at another thing, for instance. So these age structure diagrams. Uh, and another thing you can think of is, and what like when I was writing a lot of these questions, Jack was like, imagine it replacing a worksheet that you already have. So like thinking about a worksheet that you already have, instead of like printing out those worksheets and grading them, you just like assign the positive environmental science and then they, um, and then they can, you know, learn from that um, and get confidence from that and not copy each other and get a chance to redo it. So there's just like so many benefits. They can look back and look at their work. Um, when you are on your dashboard, you can also toggle between work and extra practice. So even after they've done the work to like, I usually don't assign them extra practice, but they'll tell me some of them, they do it. Um, or I could check to see if they do it too on that um, student scores area. And you could adjust like the number of questions for each one, but it's just automatically giving them all the questions. And so then they could go do the extra practice questions after they've already done the original questions and they'll have re-randomized numbers once again um, to ask about this. So these ones, the, the age structure diagrams, they all have the same eight countries, but then they're asked specific questions about different cohorts for this one. So um, they're mostly all like randomized in kind of different ways. All right, any other questions coming up in the chat? Yeah, they do really like the immediate feedback. Um, they, I think, I don't know if like any of your students also use IXL, but my students will say they like, sorry, they, they like this better than IXL because they don't see like their score plummet if they get a question wrong, they get to know and learn from it. And then even if you're um, gonna be out for like, if you get sick or something or have to take leave for whatever reason, um, they can still kind of like learn by, by trial and error and get pretty far um, if they have to, if you're out. Um, hopefully next year, by the time I have the videos, then they'll be able to like learn from the videos first. But I'll even have kids be like, like, oh, I just like figured out what not to do. And now I know what I'm doing wrong. And now I know what the answer is supposed to be. All right, I guess uh, if there aren't any other questions for Chelsea, let me show you just like a few um, like, kind of setting up things. And yeah, let me share my screen real quick. So yeah, just a couple of big picture things. And can you guys see my screen? Okay, perfect. Yeah, so Chelsea was logged in as a teacher. I'm actually logged in as Chelsea. And, but this is almost identical to what a student will see. And so there's essentially like a student uh, account built into your teacher account. And so when a student logs in, they see almost exactly this. They just don't have these options to like assign a due date or make something bonus. 
um, things like that. Um, the other thing that they don't have is the ability to um, restart any of these green things, like the ability to restart here. Um, as Chelsea mentioned, like there's a completion score and an accuracy score. The completion score, it doesn't matter how many attempts it takes, as long as they get it right, eventually that goes up into 100. The accuracy, it only goes on their first try. Um, both of those scores start at zero and they only go upwards because we thought um, I've, students, students seem to really like that and not see their score go down. Um, and then Chelsea showed you the work mode. There's also an assessment mode. And what the assessment does is it pulls questions directly from the homework. So it's the same question, but with any of the randomized numbers or randomized other things that Chelsea added. Um, and it, it pulls questions from each skill and organizes into them into an assessment. And I think it's really, really great because like students know there's no surprises. They know, OK, if I did the homework and I really understood it, then those same things will show up on the assessment. If they just guess their way through the homework, I give them credit anyways, but I know that it's gonna come back um, on the assessment. If you um, haven't, if you don't have an account yet, um, I just wanna show you a couple things to keep in mind. So first, uh, positivephysics.org, positivechemistry.org, and positivestem.org, they're all interchangeable. They're, diff they're different doors to the same place. So if you use positive physics one day and positive STEM the next day, um, all your students will still be there. All your data will still be there. The only difference is the banner at the top will say STEM, physics, or chemistry. I know some uh, environmental students, environmental science students don't want to see physics across the top. Um, it's just weird. If you haven't created an account before, you just go create account. I'm a teacher and sign up. The one thing to really keep in mind is the classroom code. It's a little different than how Google Classroom uses it. Um, the, you'll use the same classroom code with all of your students. So this is for all of your classes. You won't have like a different one for first period, second period, third period, etc. cetera. Um, once you create an account, um, I guess the, the easiest thing is just click on this help slash FAQs section. And I made a short video showing you how to add your students. There's a couple ways to do that. Students can add themselves or you can uh, copy and paste all your students in. We're working on uh, some integration where you can just pull your rosters from Google Classroom or Canvas or Schoology. And so hopefully we'll be testing that out next semester. Um, yeah, besides that, um, if you have any any environmental science questions, uh, Chelsea generously put her email right here. So reach out to, to her. If you have any uh, technical questions, I can answer those ones. My email address is right here and lots of other places on the website. And I'm always, uh, always happy to help. And oh, I guess the last thing is any course that says beta is completely free this year. Um, the other ones do require a subscription because we got to keep this thing going. But in the future, um, and we'll always do this, if your school can't cover it, we have pay what you can pricing. I know uh, Craig took advantage of that this year. Super generous of you. Um, and oh, yeah, the other thing is so Chelsea was actually the, the first one to th this got started. She mentioned that she mentioned to me in a survey that she really wanted to have. She said, I wish I had something similar to the physics for my environmental science students. Yeah, and, and he was just like, oh, do you want to make it? Yeah. <laughs> I like, so, didn't check my credentials or anything. Just <laughs> so, we to make it. Yeah, so basically, if you want to create your own stuff, um, click on the advanced tab and click on create questions. That's what we use to create all of our new questions. That's what Chelsea is using. You can organize those in your own classes and use those with your students, and that will always be uh, completely free. And when we did check on Chelsea, we checked on like what she had started to create and we thought this looks awesome and let's make this a uh, make this a public course. So, yeah, those are just kind of the uh, logistical things. But yeah, any other questions on the environmental? I was going to add about the creating the um, 
the questions that there's still like a lot you can do with it of like learning little, like little minor code things. But when it started out, it like was in HTML and Java. And now like they've built on positive physics or positive STEM, like this really user-friendly interface to create questions where um, you don't really have to have any background at all to know um, how to make randomized questions yourself, um, which is pretty cool. Yeah, and if you click on, if you go to advanced create questions, there's a couple, it's pretty easy to figure out, but there's also a couple of short videos that uh, to show you how to do it, but it's super easy to put in randomized questions that, um, yeah, uh, that have randomized values. And I've just found that the randomization and the instant feedback is just makes my life really, really nice as a, as a teacher. Um, uh, Sharon said, do I need to create a new login since mine is no longer active? Uh, Sharon, over the, like two summers ago, we deleted some. Um, but if you try to log in and you can't do it, uh, either shoot me an email or if if you created it or feel free to just like create a, a new account. Um, Catherine said, do you need a separate subscription for apes? We have a positive physics account. No, uh, any subscription that you have will uh, will cover all of your classes. And so just the only thing I'd recommend, hope, hopefully Chelsea do, doesn't mind if I show her settings. Um, no, yeah, it, that's great. Yeah, so the first thing that you do is you just go in and make any class period you teach active. And then when change the default course. So if you have a, Chelsea apparently teaches chemistry second period. So when her second period students log in, they land on the chemistry unit six. When her fourth period, that must be her environmental science course, they land on unit four. And so, um, so yeah, I think, um, yeah, any other questions? All right. Well, thank you so much for coming. And yeah, if you think of questions later, please reach out to Chelsea or me. Uh, we are super excited about seeing other people use this, especially the new environmental science stuff. So please reach out anytime. And uh, yeah, Chelsea, thank you so much for putting this together and for doing this. Yeah, I'm really happy to. Um, I've been like pouring my heart into it. So I really hope that other people get a chance to use it and find it useful too. Um, helpful, hopefully teachers find it really helpful for them to teach the class better and hopefully students um, get confidence and do better on exams and um, just enjoying enjoying the class too. So uh, yeah, thank you so much everyone who came. And yeah, like Jack said, I'm really happy to answer future questions as well if you wanna send me an email. All right. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you. Thanks.